I'm on my way to my father. But I will return. We will begin with these verses from the Holy Quran. And why should ye not fight in the cause of Allah and of those who being weak are ill-treated and oppressed? Men, women, and children whose cry is, Our Lord, rescue us from this town, whose people are oppressors, and raise for us from thee one who will protect, and raise for us from thee one who will help. Those who believe fight in the cause of Allah and those who reject faith fight in the cause of evil. So fight ye against the friends of Satan. Feeble indeed is the cunning of Satan. These verses are packed with great meaning and wisdom and describe the terrain of this satanic world, which is a combat zone where good and evil are perpetually at war. Well, how do we discern between the cause of evil and the cause of Allah? How do we identify those who fight in the cause of Allah from those who fight in the cause of evil? Why are these questions important? The spiritually blinded, wicked leaders of the Western world always classify those who fight against their tyranny, oppression, and abuse as being evil terrorists. This is among the most consistent attitude with U.S. government officials dating back hundreds of years who have used policing and military forces to squash the pleas of the defenseless indigenous and black peoples of America who from time to time rose up against gross and obvious evils. It certainly appears that the Trump administration, as with the administrations of presidents before him, continues to follow this trend. And since former Vice President Joseph Biden is assumed to be on the other side of the fence, he is conveniently acting as if he would see things differently from President Trump. However, his history, Joseph Biden's history in government service, as well as his demonic nature, proves that he would do exactly as President Trump is doing or worse. How so? Well, consider Joseph Biden's affectionate role in constructing the infamous 1994 Three Strikes Crime Bill, also known as the Violent Crime Control and Loss Enforcement Act. This law to, led to the increased privatization of, pri of prisons and swelled the numbers of black and brown men and women in the prison industrial complex as inmates, of course by the hundreds of thousands. Black political leaders touting Joe Biden as president act as though his demonic past is excusable now that President Trump appears to be the boogeyman. Consider this. One of the most controversial criminal justice issues in the, two, in the 2020 Democratic primary is a tough on crime law passed 25 years ago and authored by current poll front runner Joe Biden. If you ask some criminal justice reform activists, the 1994 crime law passed by Congress and signed by President Bill Clinton, which was meant to reverse decades of rising crime, was one of the key contributors to mass incarceration in the 1990s. They say it led to more prison sentences, more prison cells, and more aggressive policing, especially hurting black and brown Americans who are disproportionately likely to be incarcerated. If you ask Biden, that's not true at all. 
The law, he argued, at a recent campaign stop had little impact on incarceration, which largely happens at the state level. As recently as 2016, Biden defended the law, arguing it, arguing that it restored American cities following an era of high crime and violence. The Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, now known as the 1994 Crime Law, was the result of years of work by Biden, who oversaw the Senate Judiciary Committee at that time and other Democrats. It was an attempt to address a big issue in America at that time, crime, particularly violent crime. Biden reveled in the politics of the 1994 law, bragging after it had passed that, quote, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, end quote, was for now, quote, 60 new death penalties, 70 enhanced penalties, 100,000 cops, and 125,000 new state prison cells. Well, ain't that something? He would say that incarceration app happens on the state level, but he brags that 125,000 new state prison cells were created from his crime bill. Now, although Joseph Biden has offered an excuse written repentance, which is really not a repentance at, at, at all, for his racist actions, such words are not worth the breath that it took him to state them. What has been done to resolve the inordinate burden and horror that millions of families experienced and continue to experience because of this wicked crime bill, which was precisely targeted at black and brown communities. Well, let us consider Joe Biden's 1994 crime bill, which became the hallmark of President Clinton and his wife, Hillary Clinton's introduction to the president office or the office of the presidency. They all reveled in this crime bill. Well, in light of the fulfillment of this prophecy, let's consider this. Has not Joe Biden's crime bill depleted black and brown communities of their sons, fathers, brothers, husbands, uncles, while providing private enterprises, meaning companies, with free labor under the auspices of criminal justice? Now, we are also informed in these verses that Satan is cunning. Well, why should Satan be cunning instead of candid and forthright? Well, what is cunning? Cunning is skill used in a shrewd and sly manner, as in deceiving, craftiness, or guile. Well, those skill in producing Shadows over legitimate governments must be exceptionally cunning to get away with it. Well, what is a shadow government? And what is the reach of this shadow? Well, let's start with the first question, what a shadow does. Well, a shadow is a dark figure or image cast on the ground or on some surface by a body intercepting light. You have light, somebody step in front of the light, you see their shadow because it's covering you. Well, a shadow that is cast over a government disallows that government to function in the light of its constitution. That's how you know it's a shadow government. This shadow also prevents, the, the, prevents that government from functioning with due transparency so its citizens are not able to assess the dealings of its government, especially when significant policies are crafted and approved by a small group of people in secret. So a shadow government finally is defined as such. The shadow government, cryptocracy, secret government or invisible government, 
is a family of conspiracy theories based on the notion that real and actual political power resides not with publicly elected representatives, but with private individuals who are exercising power behind the scenes beyond the scrutiny of democratic institutions. According to this belief, the official elected, the official elected government is subservient to the shadow government, which is the true executive power. Some of the groups proposed by these theories as constituting the shadow government includes central banks, Freemasons, intelligence agencies, think tanks, organized Jewry, meaning the organization of so-called Jewish people, the Vatican, secret societies, Jesuits, money, moneyed interests, globalist elites, and supranational organizations who seek to manipulate policy in their own interests in order to serve a larger agenda that is hidden from the public. Okay, so you want to say that uh, this notion of a shadow government is a conspiracy theory. Well, these entities are not ethereal. They're absolutely real organizations and groups. Therefore, when we investigate the effect of the influence that these shadow inducing groups have on U.S. foreign and domestic policy and domestic policies, then such effects are not theory. You can say it's a theory, but they're reality. Well, let's consider a few of these effects based on these entities theorized to cast shadows over the U.S. government. Well, let's start with the Federal Reserve. Is it not a private bank? The private central bank responsible for printing currency and setting interest rates and other fiscal economic policies that control this nation's economy? Well, as a private bank, it shadows over the U.S. government. Why? The decision makers have competing interests, private interests. And the policies set through the Federal Reserve have reflected special interests. I don't need to go into details. There's plenty of books written on that. And over the years, Congress has tried to pass rules and laws for more transparency in the Federal Reserve. So is the Federal Reserve a conspiracy theory? How about the effect of intelligence agencies and think tanks on U.S. and U.S. foreign and domestic policies? Well, in a recent statement by former Secretary of State Colin Powell, he said that President Trump has drifted away, quote, from the U.S. Constitution. President Trump, of course, being a fighter, rebutted that former Secretary of State Colin Powell was responsible for getting us into the disastrous Middle East wars. He is referring to the war in Afghanistan in Iraq. Since these two wars were launched during President George W. Bush's administration, where Colin Powell serves as the Secretary of State. Well, it seems to me that both men, former Secretary of State Colin Powell and President Donald Trump, are evading or ignoring the real culprits behind the Middle East wars and the policies that concretize the United States government's deviation from the Constitution. One chief culprit appears to be the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. Well, let us consider this so-called think tank, whose members have influenced intelligence agencies such as the CIA and the FBI, and also many president administrations. It states of the American Enterprise Institute, or the AEI, as follows. The American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research, known simply as American Enterprise Institute, AEI, is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank that researches government, politics, economics, and social welfare. 
The AEI is an independent nonprofit organization supported primarily by grants and contributions from foundations, corporations, and individuals. Founded in 1938, AEI's stated mission is to, quote, defend the principles and improve the institutions of American freedom and democratic capitalism, limited government, private enterprise, individual liberty and responsibility, vigilant and effective defense and foreign policies, political accountability, and open debate. I'm going to pause here. Why would a think tank have a mission like that when the United States Constitution, which gave rise to the United States government, are supposed to be about those principles and others? Let's continue. The AEI is governed by a 28 board member or member board of trustees composed of executives and former executives from various corporations. Well, again, the organization is, a, is private and so are those on the board. Some AEI staff members are considered to be among the leading architects of the Bush administration's public and foreign policy. More than 28, or excuse me, more than 20 staff members serve either in a Bush administration policy post or on one of the government's many panels and commissions. Among the prominent former government officials now affiliated with AEIR, AEI Board of Trustees member Dick Cheney, Vice President of the United States under George W. Bush. John R. Bolton, former ambassador to the United Nations. Lynn Cheney, former chairman of the National Endowment for Humanities. Paul Wolfowitz, former deputy secretary of defense. Well, we will not go into the many secretive, overt and perplexing foreign and domestic policies enacted during the era of President George W. Bush, which virtually dismissed the U.S. Congress and made George Bush the first king of the United States. Check it out. Again, this is like the pink elephant in the room that Congress people to this day are ignoring and presidents ignore. And those who served former presidents also have ignored this. And look at the influence of the AEI during the eight years that President W. George Bush served. A shadow over the United States government. Well, how are divine messengers afforded this ability? Now we're getting into the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Like, how does he... How did he know all that he knew when he warned the presidents of the United States of the consequences of their actions? Well, messengers of God have an intimate relationship with Allah, who is their Lord, the Supreme Being. So it states in the Holy Quran, and he, Allah, is... It, and he is Allah in the heavens and in the earth. He knows your secret thoughts and your open words. And he knows what you earn. Now, here we're looking at a human being, not some mystery. So as we said in the previous message, we write history, then we have the ability to live it out. Allah writes the history, the 24 scientists. And through their hands and abilities, as well as the capabilities of others, these, these plans are orchestrated and lived out. Also, Allah is capable, a human being, of hearing our thinking and actually knowing what we are going to think before we think it.
Well, that's how Allah knows everything in the heavens and in the earth. Then it states in the Holy Quran, the knower of the unseen, he, so he, Allah, makes his secrets known to none except a messenger whom he chooses. So the knower of the unseen, who knows everything, he reveals some secrets to his messenger. And that's how this messenger or Messiah knows the consequences of the actions of human beings, particularly the wicked actions of leaders and what they will face because of their decisions. So when we examine the divine mission of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, we find insightful and stark warnings and divine guidance to President Ronald Reagan, President George H. W. Bush, President William Clinton, President George W. Bush, President Barack Obama, and President Donald Trump. This is six U.S. presidents from the 40th to the 45th president of the United States. They all have rejected his guidance and consequently have met with the mess that they have made. So as stated in the previous message, Joseph is one of the earliest prophetic narratives describing how Abraham's seed goes into bondage and then rises to prominence in the land where they were enslaved. Now, equally as important, again, Joseph prefigures the Messiah, the Christ. And this is affirmed in the Quranic and biblical narratives of Joseph. So it states in the Bible, and he, Joseph, dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren. And said, behold, I have dreamed a dream, a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. Now state something similar in the Holy Quran. It states, when Joseph said to his father, O my father, I saw 11 stars in the sun in the moon. I saw them making obeisance to me. Now, as stated in the previous message, neither the biblical nor Quranic narrative of Joseph shows where the sun, moon and stars made obeisance to Joseph. We discuss how this dream or scene applies to the advent of the Christ whom Joseph prefigures. And it refers to the Honorable Louis Farrakhan's vision like experience, wherein he was brought to the great mother plane by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in September of 1985. In addition, between 1975, where the, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departed to the mother plane, under the covering that he died. He escaped a death plot. Between that time, 1975 and 1985, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan underwent tremendous trials that mirror the trials described in Joseph's journey, and those included being betrayed by his brethren, falsely accused, and marginalized by his enemies. 